Jesus was at a party one day. And he said to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. How many of you, how many of us, would ever think of doing something like that guy did on that video? Party like that. I mean, you know, I know uh, that Jesus didn't say do this with a camera crew, right? And I know Jesus didn't say do this with your social media handle on the back of your hat. And he didn't say do this to generate, you know, clicks and, and ad revenue. Um, but on the other hand, this is, I'm pretty sure this is a Jewish guy. Uh, Jewish guy with a beard doing the exact thing that the Jewish guy with a beard who we follow uh, said for us to do. He's doing it and we're not. I think it's worth us paying attention to. So would you ever imagine doing something like this? Take out the sensational elements the fact that it's in New York City and it's a rooftop and it's fancy and uh, it's these, these four homeless gentlemen. Take out those sensational elements. Think about the Super Bowl party that you had like last week, if you had one, or the barbecue that you threw over the summer or whatever. Who is on your guest list? Who are you inviting over to your house on a Friday night for dinner? Is it just your friends, your relatives, your rich neighbors? Or is it people who can't pay you back? And I don't want to let anyone off the hook. Maybe you're not someone who hosts parties. Maybe you're not someone who opens your house up to other people to come. Um, When is the last time you invited someone into your life or into your friendship? When's the last time you opened up um, your wallet or opened up your time or your energy, your care? When's the last time you opened up yourself to someone um, who is outside of the scope of where you normally would be. I said a few weeks ago that we have a tendency to be really good, or at least kind of good, at loving people who we know we're gonna get something back from. Even if it's just friendship, even if it's just um, care, um, even if it's just companionship, we're good at loving people who we know why we love them, because we get something back from them. The question that Jesus, I think, asks of us in this is, Who do you love that is disadvantageous for you to love? Who do you love that the answer to why isn't isn't super clear? Who do you love that's disadvantageous for you to love? If you can't answer that, and if you can't answer that quickly, there's a problem. Either your understanding of what love is is just not what Jesus is. We talked about this a few weeks ago, too. Um, The way we're supposed to, the way we're called to understand love, it looks just like Jesus, right? It's good for the other person. It might not be so good for you. It's good for the other person. Um, It's going to cost you something. It's going to be something you have to sacrifice. It's going to be self-giving. It's going to put you in a position of a servant. So maybe your understanding of love isn't like that. And so, of course, you don't love people who are disadvantageous for you to love. But implied in that is really a love that is really just self-centered. It's about what you give so you can get back. Maybe that's where you are, but maybe it's just that your scope, your field of vision for who you're supposed to, called to, who you can love is just just too narrow. It's just too um, poorly defined. The problem with this, here it is, is do you know who Jesus was talking to? Who um, who Who the host of the party he was at that he said, you know, when you invite someone, He was at the house of a leader of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, if you don't know this, I want to tell you the Pharisees um, were basically the leaders of the Jewish people at that point. I mean, Jesus was Jewish, everyone was Jewish. They were basically the leaders of these people. 
Um, they were the ones who, in a lot of ways, were responsible for sharing with the people who God was and what God was like, um, for opening up God's word and saying, you know, this is good, this is not good. Like, this is in, this is out. Like, this is who God shows himself to be. The Pharisees had very clear lines about who was in and who was out, who was worthy of being at that table and who was unworthy, right? Who was advantageous for them to spend time with and who was uh, disadvantageous. That's what, the, that's what the Pharisees were good at. Um, but the Pharisees also, what they were, they were the people who shared who God was. They were the people who were responsible for bringing God to people and people to God. If you were here last week, you remember, um, I talked about that the entire sermon. That's our job now. The Pharisees are no longer a people. They're no longer around. Instead, um, we are the ones who are responsible for bringing God to people and people to God. We talked about that as we're the royal priesthood. And so here's the problem. If we can't answer the question, who do you love that's disadvantageous for you to love, if, if we can't answer that and answer it quickly, I am afraid that we are painting ourselves into the story as the Pharisees rather than the people who do what Jesus um, want us to do. Here's the thing with the Pharisees. Jesus was not so kind to them. I mean, Jesus was kind to everyone, but he wasn't so kind to them. He was harsh with them. Um, he reserved all of his judgment for them. Why? Because they were the people who paraded around like they were religious, like they had the answers, like they knew who God was, and they were supposed to represent God in the world, bring God to people and people to God, and they were doing the opposite. They were doing the opposite, and that's why Jesus had his harshest judgment reserved for them. They completely missed the point. They completely missed the boat. They completely missed what Jesus was all about. And I am up here this morning to tell you, to tell myself, that I don't want to miss the point anymore. I don't want to be part of a community that misses the point anymore. I want us to get what Jesus is talking about and actually go and do it. And so what we're going to do this morning is going to be kind of a different sermon. We're going to crack open uh, that little section of teaching that Jesus gives there. And we're going to um, explain it. But really what I want us to do is I want us to think about the way we think about the world around us. And about ourselves and our place in it and our relationships. Um, so that we can be the people who do the thing that Jesus says for us to do. Rather than the religious people who just say we do and we actually don't. That's what I want for us that's what I want for us this morning. And so um, the very first thing that he says, and it comes in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at it again here. This is what he says. He said, he also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. Um, Jesus' basic w way of doing things are, um, if there's even a hint of selfishness in the invitation that you're looking to extend, you got to stay away from that kind of thing. You ha like, you can't let that self-centeredness even, um, even be entertained. And it's kind of a radical thing to do. But before we really dig into that, I need to explain a little bit about the way that meals worked in that day, the way luncheons and dinners function. Um, they function something like this today for us, but not quite. Back then, it was a little more formal. Um, in those days, if you were invited to a meal, if you were invited to a luncheon or a dinner, let's say, that meant that you were in, that you were in the party, you were part of the in crowd. It meant that you were valuable enough to be at the table. It meant that you were um, worthy enough to be at the table. It meant that there was some reason why you should be there based on who you are as a person, right? Um, that's the way that like, things worked in those days. And so invitations um, were kind of a currency for social relationships. Um, invitations extended were basically like a way, um, they were kind of like an economy, right? And they were a way to like tell who was in and who was out. The right people were there, the wrong people weren't. Insiders were there, outsiders were obviously not there. In the Gospel of Luke, this is something that Jesus attacks again and again and again. I mean, he turns this on its head and he really devastates that way of looking at the world, um, both socially, but also like in the religious world at that time. But this is sort of an economy of how this all works, an economy of relationships, who's in, who's out. 
And how the Pharisee economy worked was basically um, a fair exchange of goods and services. It was basically transactional in nature. It's, I give you a dollar and you give me a cup of coffee, right? I give in order to get something in return. And so a Pharisee is going to invite his friends to the party because friends are good for our lives. Friends provide us with, um, well, friendship, right? Friends, compo- friends provide us with companionship. Um, friends are there because, you know, the Pharisee needs to have his couch moved once in a while and his fridge moved and he can't do that by himself. So he needs friends, right? That's why, that's why he would invite friends to the party. Why would he invite family to the party? I mean, we live in New Jersey. We have mafia and mob ties. We know what family is all about, right? <laughs> family is there for you when no one else is. When you've lost your job, when you've lost your home, it's family who you could fall back on. It's family who is there for you thick and thin regardless of what you're doing. Family is the one that don't really judge you according to your flaws, but they're family. It's good to have family around. A Pharisee would invite his rich neighbors. Why? Well, it's obvious. If you extend an invitation to a rich guy, to an important person, and they receive it and they come to your party, that makes you important. That makes you significant. Inviting rich neighbors was a way of, of, of making your own social status kind of rise that ladder and um, climb up that ladder. And so that's what, that's what they did. A Pharisee would invite these kind of people because there's an expectation inherent and implied that it will be reciprocated, that there will be reciprocity, that, you know, I give the dollar, I get the coffee back. They'll be able to repay you. Um, it is basically transactional in nature right? You give the dollar, you get the cup of coffee back. You go to the store, you give the cashier the person, you give it back. Um, If you think about that for a second, this way of relating, this way of doing business is just inherently self-centered, right? Because you don't go to the store to give the cashier a dollar because you love the cashier. You don't go to the store and give them a dollar because you think they would benefit from the dollar more than you do. The only reason you're interacting with that person is because you know they can give you the thing that you've agreed a dollar is worth, and that's a cup of coffee. And so you're giving a dollar to the person, but it's only to get something in return. And so we don't feel good about ourselves. The cashier is also not giving us a cup of coffee because they love us, right? The cashier is not doing that out of the goodness of her heart. She's doing that because she knows this is what a cup of coffee is worth, and I want the dollar more than I want this coffee. This sort of transactional nature of our relationships um, if you think about it, it is, it is purely self-centered. The only reason I give is to get something out of it, right? This is the thing, though. This is the way that we operate. We operate this way just naturally. We're friends with people who we know we can get something back from, right? We extend ourselves. We give ourselves. We give time to people who we know it's going to be worth it for us to give our time to. Um, We're going to like invest in that person a little bit because we know we're going to see some sort of return on that investment. I mean, how many of us maintain friendships with people who we have no hope of getting anything out of? It's it's just, it's not saying it doesn't happen, but like how many of us um, maintain friendships, relationships, even with family members where we say, you know, I get nothing out of this, but it's good for them, so whatever. It happens occasionally, but that's the exception. Um, It's not the rule. Because our baseline is transactional in nature. I give to you, you give back to me. Um, It is is a bunch of really, really short-term investments, right? I give a dollar, you give me the coffee. That's, That's the Pharisee economy. That's sort of the way our economy of relationships work. That we love people who are advantageous for us to love. The way that Jesus' economy of love works, I mean, you could see it up there. It is completely different than this. He says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And you could see it up there. The people who we're supposed to invite to our party are the people, I mean, In those days, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, these were people who were obviously outsiders. These were people who obviously had no place at the table because they couldn't give anything in return. They had nothing and they could offer nothing. And so they were excluded. They were out. Jesus is saying, those are the people who we have to be inviting. 
Those are the people who you have to be inviting, people who intentionally cannot repay you. And so if the Pharisees' way of doing things is transactional in nature, I mean, ours is the opposite of that, whatever that is. It's un- untransactional. Um, really, what it is, is it's charity-based. It's giving not for the sake of what we get, but for the sake of what they get. You don't give, you don't invite, you don't offer things. You don't open yourself up so that you can get something, but so that they can get something. This is like one of the basics of why we do good things. You know, a lot of people struggle with the question of like, why do we give money to poor people? Is it because God wants us to? Is it because it's the right thing to do? Is it because it's moral? Is it because the Bible says so? We give money to poor people because poor people need money and we have it. Because it's good for them. It's like a, it, it's a very basic thing. That's why God wants us to give because it's good for those people. It's not, um, here's a buck, now where's my coffee? It's, here's a buck. It looks like you need that. You would be better with that than I would. Jesus' way of doing things here, it's not transactional. Um, but I want you to think about it like this. It's more like an investment. It's more like a long-term investment. It's actually a long, long, long-term investment. Except we don't hope to see the return on the investment. It's an investment that we make, that we give of ourselves, but we don't actually hope to get um, the return on that investment, at least, at least not in this lifetime. Jesus says, you know, resurrection of the righteous, that's after the end, after the end, after the end. Um, that's when we're going to get our payment, but in this life, we shouldn't go about things expecting that kind of return on investment. We do it for their gain, not for our gain. It's an investment um, for God, for God's kingdom, for God's people, for God's family here on earth. And so the question that I want to ask you um, is, which of these two economies do you work under? Which of these two economies do you live with? Do you um, invest yourself in people's lives to see a return out of it for you? Or do you invest yourself in people's lives simply because it's good for them. If you're a follower of Jesus, and we as a church, I mean, a community of Jesus followers, we are called to the latter, to invest in people and expect to see nothing in return simply because it is good for them. The people we are called to invest in are people um, who cannot repay us, who are disadvantageous. And listen, a lot of times these are people who don't think like us, who don't look like us, who don't live like us, who don't act like us, who aren't already part of our circles, who are, um, let's call them outsiders. This is what God, this is who God wants us to invest in. Because remember, our role is to bring God to people and people to God. Not so that we gain or that our lives are better or even so that our church gets bigger, but it's so that those people can come to know the hope that you have come to know as a Jesus follower. So that those people can come to be called out of the same darkness that you were called out of into his marvelous light. So that those people might be able to experience the same life that you have experienced, right? The same comfort that you have experienced. Um, receive the same salvation that you have received that Jesus extends to each and every person. It's our job, bringing God to people and people to God. And so the question that I want um, you to ask yourself, I'm going to ask you is, Who can you invest in? Who can you uh, invest in who is an outsider to this community or to even your world right now? Who is someone, think about it, who needs to know Jesus who doesn't know Jesus already? Who needs life again? Who you can invest in? Who's an outsider? Who is not necessarily advantageous for you to love? I want to challenge you. just concretely today, tomorrow, to, th- uh, to invest in that person. Investing is going to look like inviting them into your life and not really knowing where it's going to go. Investing is going to look like opening up your time, opening up your table, right? Opening up your friendships, opening up yourself to people and inviting them into your lives. It's also sometimes going to look like you inviting yourself into their lives. You seeing the people around you, what they're struggling with, um, you know, what their issues are, where their hope is lost, right? Where life is not really being lived, and you um, inviting yourself into those places. 
to get to know them, to get to know what makes them tick, to get to know what their hopes and dreams are, um, to get them to know where, where they're missing God and why and what that would actually mean for their lives. Investing is going to mean um, providing real things that we want, right? Like friendship, like companionship, like hope, like help. That's what investing in someone means. I mean, you're all super smart people. I don't need to tell you too much. What, is, what does it mean to invest in the life of someone um, who isn't a part of this community or isn't a part of uh, the church or someone who doesn't believe in Jesus? The question is, will you actually do it? Will you do it? Because we have all sorts of reasons why we won't do it, right? Um, we're afraid of what it might mean. We're afraid of what it might cost. We're afraid of, like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. And if, if that's what you're feeling, if that's the fear that's kind of going on there, that's good. That's a good place for you to be. That's exactly the point that Jesus wants to drive you to. To ask yourself, oh, gosh, I don't know what it will cost to invest in that person, but that's what I'm called to do, so I'm going to do it. I mean, that's a good place. That's a good place for you to be wrestling. Because what Jesus calls us to, it is a little scary. It is a love that costs something. It is something that might be disadvantageous for us and our lives. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, am I going um, to do what Jesus said? Or am I just going to keep pretending like I'm a religious person, parading around like a religious person? Am I just going to keep being more like a Pharisee than like what Jesus said for us to do? Because our job is to bring God to people and people to God, not to say we're going to do it, not to pretend that we're going to do it, but it's to actually do it. If not, we are just missing the point completely. This is what Jesus wants from us. This is what investment is like also. It costs something, and it's going to cost something. But that's what we're called to do as Jesus' followers. That's what he wants us to do regularly, to invest in the lives of outsiders for the sake um, of them, for their life. Uh, in doing so, it grows his people. It grows the church, not just our church, but the church. But it's also it's also kind of worth remembering here um, that it's not just about investing. It's not just about investing in the lives of people. We have to remember the context of what Jesus is saying here. The context is, um, it's within the context of an invitation, of when you invite someone, right? When you invite someone. And in fact, the very next thing that Jesus does here is he tells a parable. He tells a story um, of someone who invited people and they didn't come because, because, you know, they had all kinds of excuses and whatnot. Um, and the one who threw the party said, no, 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 go out and invite more people. Invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Invite people who are living out on the streets. Invite, invite, invite. And what Jesus means to say with all of that is that God wants his house full. God wants his people full. And so invite, 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 invite. And so along with, you know, who can you invest in? The question is, who can you invite in? Who can you invite in? And I'll put it like this, and this is like a simplification, right? But when is the last time you invited someone in? When is the last time you invited someone to come with you on a Sunday morning? When's the last time you invited someone to church? I'll tell you, earlier this week, I had a chance to do this. I was, um, one of my wife's students, former students, their house kind of burned down, and so uh, they lost all their stuff, and so she's been collecting cl clothes and donations and all that kind of stuff. Um, please don't get any more. We, there's too much. But um, she was doing that, like, all of last week. They can give gift cards. Um, she was doing that all last week, and I think we established in the past that she's a much better person than I am. Um, <laughs> But so my job was simply to go pick up some of this stuff. And on Monday, she said, hey, there's someone who lives like less than 10 minutes away from park. I was at work. Um, after work, can you go pick it up? And it was a girl who I used to know like from 10, 15 years ago. Um, I hadn't seen her in a long time. So I go to her house. I go to pick up this stuff. And there's a lot of bags. And we're catching up. We're talking. There's a lot of time I'm spending there. Um, and I'm talking with her. And I'm asking how things are going. What's your life like? What's the last 15 years been like? And she starts to open up. She starts to share about what her life is like. And I, I'm not going to give you all the details, but just suffice it to say, the last 10 years have not been good for this girl. 
Like the last 10 years have been tough. She's, she's struggled, um, you know, you could see she's struggling with loneliness. Um, she's struggling with kind of where her place is in the world. Um, it sounds like life has just become dull. It's become mundane. And she's looking, she's looking for something else to kind of lift her out of that. Um, she needs companionship. She needs friendship. She needs community, um, all this sort of stuff. And so, you know, we're packing up my car with all the bags and whatnot. And the thing that I do is I, as I say to her, all right, thanks. See you later. And I get in my car and I drive away. Why didn't I invite her to church? I don't know. Like, my pledge to you is that's the last time I'm not going to do that, right? That's, I mean, that's, that's the last time. Because here's the thing. I know that what she needs, I know that what she needs, because it's what everyone needs, is a relationship with Jesus that gives them life. And I think you're only going to find that in the context of a local church. And this is a local church, right? And she could find that here. Um, what she needs, though, is she needs community. She needs friendship. She needs a place for her and her son to be a part of that's bigger than who she is. She needs to be pulled out of the mundaneness of life, right? And I know that she would find that here. I know she would find friendship um, she would have a chance of finding that relationship here. I know that she would. So why didn't I invite her? I don't know. The question is, why don't you invite people if you don't? When's the last time you have, for real? Here's the thing. We um, do a lot at Park Church. We work very hard at making this church, this Sunday morning experience, um, from the moment you park your car into the moment you leave, a place where you should feel confident inviting anyone to come. Your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, anyone that you've been investing yourself in, you should feel comfortable and confident inviting them here. I mean, it's why we do a lot of the things th that we do. Um, it's why we do them a little differently. It's why we intentionally don't use a lot of churchy words. So it's why you're sitting in the auditorium right now and not the sanctuary, for instance. It's why you walk through the front doors and not the narthex. Because what's the narthex but, you know, something that German shot at you in, like, World War I, right? What the heck's narthex, right? Um, it's, why, uh, it's why we do coffee and bagels like we do, and we hope you bring your coffee in. Don't intentionally spill it, but if you spill it, it's fine. Like, it's fine. Um, it's why we do the kids' program like we do, and because, like, we know that for young families coming to a new church for the first time, it's super intimidating. You're like literally entrusting your babies into the hands of total strangers. That's a crazy thing to do. And so we want to make that as welcoming, as easy, as simple as possible. And we work very hard to make that happen here at Park Church. Um, it's what we, I, we give a lot of our time to here. Because we want to make it so that you can confidently and comfortably invite any of your friends, neighbors, coworkers, whoever, anyone you're investing in here. And the question that I want to ask you, and like I really want to know the answer, is why wouldn't you invite someone here? If it's because of something about you, right? Maybe you're afraid to. Maybe you're ashamed that you're a part of church. Maybe you're not comfortable sharing that with your work people yet, whatever it is. Um, maybe you're afraid that if you invested in someone and... Um, and they didn't accept the invitation, or they came once or twice and they never really want to come back, maybe you're afraid that's going to change your relationship. That's going to ruin things. That's going to hurt things. Um, that's a reasonable thing to be afraid of. And that's happened to us a few times. We've invited people to come, and they've come once, they've come a few times, um, and they never came back. And we thought, oh, shoot, that's going to really change things. And it didn't, because we didn't let it, because we're adults and we can get over that kind of thing, right? It's not, it's not going to be for everyone. It's not going to connect for everyone. If it's something about you that you're not inviting someone, Here's what I want. I want you to figure that out and just to use the parlance of our time to get over it, right? To stop being afraid of that, to stop being ashamed of that, um, to actually just do it, to take the risk to extend the invitation. But here's what I really want. If it's something about us, I want to know about it. We want to know about it. Because here is the scenario that goes on in my head, okay? I have... I have nightmares about three things. Dinosaurs, <laughs> super-powered dogs that have taken over Mars and are threatening our colonies there. We could talk about that later. Um, and this scenario here, okay? You have invested in the life of your coworker. 
and you have spent months, years becoming friends with this person, loving this person, um, you genuinely love them, right? And um, you spend all your time, you want them to come to know Jesus. You know that them coming to know Jesus and being, that's going to happen in a church like this. And so for years, for months, for years, you've taken the chance to in, encourage them to come. You've extended that invitation to them. And finally, one Sunday, they show up here. And something that we do chases them away. I have a nightmare about that. If there is something that we are doing that would stop you from inviting someone to come to Park Church on a Sunday morning, I want to know about it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to literally, right now, take a Connect card out of the seat back in front of you and write down the answer, write down the answer to this prompt right here. I don't feel comfortable inviting this person to Park Church because. And um, if you're willing to put your name on it, I would love that so we could follow up and have a conversation because I want to learn from you what we're missing. But if you're not going to be as honest because you're putting your name on it and you're afraid what I or someone else will think of you, don't put your name on it because we want to really know why you wouldn't actually invite someone to Park Church. Because listen, this is all that actually matters. This is all that actually matters. To the degree that we are a church that just exists for the people who are here or who are like us or who are from other churches, like, whatever. We have designed this church to be a church intentionally so that you are comfortable and confident and excited to invite your non-church-going friends and neighbors and family members and coworkers to. And if we're not doing something right, we want to know about it. And it's, it's like what I'm going to work on this week. Like, it's all that we want to work on this week. Because this is what, I mean, this is what we're for. For bringing God to people and people to God. If we're not going to be able to do that successfully because of something we're doing, we need to know about it and be able to change that. That's, that's the church um, that we want to be. That's the church that we want you to be excited about, right? It's your job to invest in people. It's your job to invite people. But it's our job to make sure what you're inviting them to is worth inviting them to. And so if you can't do your job because I can't do my job or we as a staff can't do our job, we need to know about it to be able to do our job better. Because it's not about us. It's about the us who aren't here yet. It's about the people who are outside of this community whose lives would be forever transformed by a relationship with Jesus, who we would just call outsiders um, who are just waiting to become insiders so that they can get involved with this too. And that's what we're inviting you into here uh, at Park Church. It's why we want um, to work as hard as we can to learn throughout this time to love where we live differently. Let's pray. God, we uh, thank you for the way that you inv have invited us to your side. You've invited us to your table. Um, though we, we know there are all kinds of reasons why you should disinvite us and would disinvite us and could disinvite us. You've invited us nonetheless. and You've made a space for us at your table. And for that, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, that you've shown yourself to us, that you have opened the door for us to come in and feast at your table, that you have chased after us with mercy because you love us. Lord, what we want is for this community to be a place that intentionally loves people who, who, are, who are disadvantageous to love, who maybe aren't like us, who maybe don't think like us or look like us or believe like us. Lord, help us to invest in the lives of those outsiders who are in our orbit. Lord, just in practical terms, um, help us to invest in them. Help us to get over the fears that we have. If we need courage, Lord, give us courage. If we need a spark, give us a spark. God, help us practically to invite people in as well. Help us, God, um, show us when and how to do that inviting. Um, give us the courage to do that. Lord, and if there's things about the way we do things that needs to change, we want to know about that. We want to be able to change them um, for your sake, God, and for the sake of your kingdom and your mission and your people here at Park Church. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for life today um, and life forever. In Jesus' name, amen.